Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me over the? Okay, great. So today what we're gonna be covering is the newest operating system to your Apple laptops and desktops, which the nickname is Catalina. It's operating system 10.15, and that's the most recent release of the Mac operating system, which came out on October 7th of 2019. It was released to the public. There have been uh, several updates since then, and what I'm gonna to cover today is most or all of the new features that you will see in Mac OS Catalina version 10.15 that were not there in previous versions, including Mojave. So even since 10.14, which was out about a year and three months ago, there have been a, a dozen or two dozen improvements to the operating system that are brand new. And that's what I'm gonna to cover today in this class. So I'll try to ask, so if you have questions about the topic we're covering on the screen, go ahead and ask that as we go. But if something else comes up that you think of a question as to keep the process moving, hold that. I'll stop about five minutes before the break for questions, and then there'll be time at the end for questions. But so if it's not relevant to the, what we're talking about at the time, if you can hold that until we get to a point where we can answer those to help the show move along a little faster. So a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Jeff Bohr. I'm an Apple certified support professional. So every year I go and take three days of classes and pass an exam with Apple so that I stay certified with Apple. I've been using uh, Apple computers since 1986. I've never owned a PC. And uh, 14 years ago, helping people with computers started interfering with my job. So I quit my job and now I do this full time. <laughs> So a little naming versions about Catalina. So they've all had private and public versions since they were released. The first version of operating uh, OS 10 or OS X was in September of 2000. So instead of saying I'm running Catalina or I'm running Snow Leopard, it's, or it's easier to say that than saying 10.13.2.6. So they started naming the operating systems after the name of Big Cats until 2013 when they switched to the names of locations in Apple's home state of California, probably because they were running out of feline names. So these are some of the versions of Mac OS that came out. So in 2001, I think, uh, or 2000, uh, 2.0 Cheetah came out, 10.1 was out in 2002, 2001, I, uh, let's see, let me get my glasses here, some of these are covered up by other things. So Panther came out in 2003, Tiger came out in 2004. The second version of Tiger came out in 2005, Leopard came out in 2007, they skipped a year there. And then in 2000, we had, or 2009, I'm sorry, we had Snow Leopard, followed by Lion, Mountain Lion, Mavericks, Yosemite, which was just five years ago now, El Capitan, Sierra, followed by High Sierra. Last year we had Mojave, and this year we have operating system 10.15, which was Catalina, which was released to the public on October 7th. That was introduced at last year's Worldwide Developers Conference on June 3rd, 2019. And four months later, it was out to the public after some beta testing over the summer. The name refers to Santa Catalina Island, and that's the island that is pictured there. So Mac OS Catalina is only available from the App Store. So it used to be you would, years ago, you would get these items on a disc and you'd have to order a disc for 20 bucks or $99 to pop the disc in. Well, there are no discs anymore that are widespread after Netflix started their game, you know? So when was the last time you actually put a CD in your machine? I would bet it was years. So if you still have a slot. So it's only available from the app store. Now some hardware requirements. Basically, there's a lot of little stuff at the top, the 10.9, the four gigabytes of memory, 12 gigabytes of storage space. Those aren't gonna be a problem for any of the computers that are listed. So there are only a certain model of computers available that are compatible with Mac OS Catalina and they're listed here. So any early 2015 or newer MacBooks, any 2012 or newer from mid 2012 MacBook Airs and MacBook Pros, the iMac Mini from late 2012 or newer, 
the iMac from late 2012 are newer, the iMac Pro from 2017, and the iMac Pro from late 2013 are newer. If you're not sure which model computer you have, if you go to the Apple menu and about this Mac, on the first tab that shows up, you'll have your computer number and it'll say mid-2012 or, or whatever it is. So if it's newer, if it's at this level or newer, you can install Catalina. So some more hardware requirements. Uh, requirements for Siri, you obviously need internet and a microphone. For dictation, you need a microphone. For gestures and spotlight, for gestures, you need certain kind of track pads, and those are all listed here. For photo booth, you need a camera that's available. Uh, for FaceTime, that also needs a built-in camera. For, let's get to the next. Jeff, can I yes. ask you one thing? This thing, we like to minimize that. Do you think you can? Yes. Thank oh, that'll you. hide it. Okay, I didn't know about that. Thank you. So more feature requirements. These are also hardware requirements. So if you want to use continuity camera or handoff or instant hotspot with your phone to be able to use your phone as a Wi-Fi router if you're in a hotel somewhere, you need these models of computers. So that's a little more stringent than the hardware requirements for the whole Catalina upgrade. So if you want to use these specific features, continuity camera, handoff, instant hotspot, or universal clipboard, you'll need a MacBook 2015 or newer, uh, 2012 MacBook Pro or newer, Mac Mini 2012 or newer, late 2013 MacBook Mac Pro or iMac 2012 or newer. Continuity camera also requires an iPhone or an iPad with a lightning connector and iOS 12 or later. So Instant Hotspot requires an iPhone or iPad with cellular connectivity with a lightning connector and iOS 8.1 or later. And you have to have personal hotspot service signed up through your carrier. There's a feature called Auto Unlock we'll review. That is only supported by Mac models overall from mid 2013 or later. And it requires an Apple Watch with OS 3 or later and an iPhone 5 or later. So we'll cover what the Auto Unlock does, but those are the requirements to be able to do that. Some more requirements for features. Apple Pay on the web is supported by only a few models, uh, most of the models actually. Uh, that requires MacBook Pro with the touch bar or an Apple Watch with OS 3. Uh, phone calling and, and SMS messages and the home app requires certain configurations with iOS versions. AirDrop also has some hardware requirements, which are mostly newer machines. AirPlay also needs a, a second generation Apple TV and one of these models are newer. So if you download these nodes, you can check specifically whether your model fits in with these parameters for these different services. You, you, there's nothing you have to worry about until you need that service. So Metal 2 is a, a feature for graphics that's supported by only a few models, uh, most of which are also uh, covered with Catalina. And uh, then Power Nap is another feature that allows your computer to kind of be asleep but still receive email messages and alerts, even while it's, the lid is closed and it's technically sleeping. Boot Camp is another feature that needs uh, certain requirements. Uh, Exchange Support has certain requirements. The Mac App Store, you're supposed to be 13 or older, which I think everyone in this room is safe, so you can sign up for a free App Store account. So macOS Catalina, one of the big things that's happened is that you've seen warnings for, for a couple of months, is these things that say 32-bit apps will not be supported. You might see a warning like this. It says Microsoft Word is not optimized for your Mac and needs to be updated. This app will not work with future versions of macOS and needs to be updated to improve compatibility. Contact the developer for more information. Well, this is the future. If you install Catalina, 32-bit apps do not work. So that's what I'm gonna show you, how to identify 32-bit apps if you have not upgraded to Catalina yet so that you know which ones will be dead in the water. Because as soon as you update to Catalina, these 32-bit apps will never open again on that machine. So this app used to appear in Mojave every 30 days and then uh, it, you start seeing it when you launch something and you'll see this message and uh, 
unless you know someone at Microsoft or a text wrangler that you can call personally and say, hey, would you please start working on a 64-bit app? A lot of these apps just kind of died with Catalina because it takes a lot of developer resources and time to be able to retrofit. They have to write the code from scratch. So not everyone came up with a 64-bit app to replace a 32-bit app that was being retired. So there are quite a few apps, and I'll cover some of them that you're just kind of out of luck if you install Catalina. So the first way, the native way on a Mac to find 32-bit apps on your Mac is through the system report that's built in. So if you open a finder window and click on the Apple menu and you select about this Mac, on the first tab, there's a button that says system report. In the left column of the system report, you can scroll down to the software section. And this is all in the notes, so you don't have to write it down, but it's on uh, slide number 15 or 18, if you're, if you're interested. So you have to scroll down to software and then select applications. The section's gonna go blank for a minute. It's gonna look like nothing's there because it's loading all your apps. When the Windows appears, it'll have two sections. The top section is the software. The bottom section shows more detail. So what you'll see is a window like this. And see that second column where it says 64-bit Intel? That's where the 32 apps are identified. So in your Mac system report, 32 apps will say no in that column. So the column specifies if they're 64-bit compatible. Most of those say yes. Poor Little Heroes of the Storm says no. So that will not work after you saw Catalina. So this is in the system report of the Apple uh, system preferences option. Now there's another program that's free by a company called Go64. And they've developed a little app that you can download over the web for free and it's safe to download, and it will identify just a list of 32-bit apps. So it's a little easier than going through Apple's list, I think, and trying to look for all the no's, whereas this will just isolate. It'll take an inventory of all the apps. It'll go to the developer's website. So if you have an old version of Text Wrangler, Go64 will actually say, yes, there's a new version available. They've updated it to 64-bit. So they've done the research to present some information to you that'll help you decide what your next move may be. And it will also show you the costs of those available updates. So Go64 has done all the research and they have some other products that they generate income from. So I don't think they're making any money off this, but it's a nice feature. So what happens in Go64 is you can tell it to specify just 32-bit apps at the top in the center there where you can say show 32-bit only so in this case, all of these apps are 32-bit apps. They will cease to exist when Catalina is installed. So Go64 is an easy way to help you identify which apps could be problematic. If there's an app you use three times a week to make labels or something, and it's on this list, and they haven't fixed it, you're out of luck if you install Catalina. You won't be able to use that anymore. There's a popular scanner that I used to use called Neat. It was called this neat scanner and they made a wireless scanner. They made a little portable scanner and you can put your receipts in there and your paperwork and stuff. That's not 64 bit compatible. If you install Catalina, your neat scanner will cease to exist. It needs a pretty big company, but they haven't released a 64 bit server version of their software yet. So like I said, unless you know someone that you can influence to tell them to get off their butt and make some upgrades, a lot of these companies are probably just not going to support this. And that's just the way it is. So these are some of the 32-bit apps that were killed by Catalina. You used to be able to still run iWeb before this happened. That will no longer work over Catalina. Any versions of Microsoft from 2008 or 2011. Neat receipts. Picasa, which was retired by Google several years ago, but some people still have the app on their computer. It will cease to function after Catalina. iPhoto which has maybe been in your dock since the photos upgrade three or four years ago. That'll just have a little cross through it. You'll never be able to open it again. But all your photos were transitioned over to the Photos app several years ago. So that's just kind of been a duplicate. So that'll actually save you some space 
Aperture, which has worked for several years, stops working with Catalina. So if you're using an Aperture library, and there are ways to get the photos out of the Aperture program, the program will not work, but your photos are safe. If you accidentally hit upgrade to Catalina, you can still get into the Aperture file and extract the photos if you need to. There's instructions all over the web on how to do that. So the photos are safe, it's the file and the windows that won't work anymore. Scan stat manager. So these are just some of the ones that I found. And there's a whole list um, on the Go64 website and some other websites where you can find a list of all the 32-bit apps if you do a Google search. And one 32-bit app that was killed by Catalina and then brought back by the software developer was Adobe Creative Cloud. So when I've, Catalina was released on October 7th, 2019, Adobe didn't release the 64-bit version of this app until November 4th. So for four weeks, people were like lost. They couldn't use their Photoshop. They couldn't use any of the Creative Cloud apps that they had subscribed to because Adobe hadn't updated this. And then finally, one day, about four weeks later, they released an update. So they did convert their 64, their 32-bit app to 64. And I use that stuff a lot. So that was one I was paying attention to because it wouldn't work. So for about four weeks, I was locked out of my Photoshop because I didn't have an older version of my hard drive and only had the subscription version. It wouldn't work without this Creative Cloud app. So I think they must have had enough heat from all the users to get off their butts and, and fix it because they, they did it pretty quick relatively. So Mac OS Catalina, every year that they upgrade something, something goes away. This year with Catalina, it's dashboard. So remember that little screen to the left of your desktop with the calculator and with the post-it notes and with some other things? That does not exist under Catalina. So the dashboard has ceased to exist. They had stocks there. So goodbye calculator, goodbye weather, goodbye little shortcuts. The dashboard does not work anymore and you won't be able to see it. Yes, sir. They might have released a 64-bit by now, but as of like three days ago when I was checking this list, they had not. And like you said, there's a big company. You would think they would pay attention to this. So it's, but it's been three months and they had the software in May or June. <laughs> So the beta software for Catalina came out in May or June. The people wanted, wanted to update started doing it then, I think. It's the other people that haven't, the fire hasn't gotten big enough under them or something. But yeah, scan, scan snap. And you can check that. If you, if you have a question about something you saw on that list, go to the scan snap website, go to the Microsoft website, search for 64-bit compatibility. They'll say, oh yeah, we just released this on January 5th. Yeah, or if you know someone, but you can go on the website usually, and if they've released an update, you'll be able to find it pretty easily. Yes, ma'am. Well, they'll, they'll look like, they'll have this symbol over them, but it'll be white. So your 32-bit apps will look like this with the, the cross slash symbol through it. And those will be in your applications folder. And so far, I haven't found a way to identify them easily. I've just gone through and deleted them when I see them, kind of. Command delete or move them to the trash. You could delete it from Launchpad. You know, so you can delete these any way you want because they're never going to work on your current machine again. If you had an old 2016 laptop or something, you, or 28, I don't know, an older machine, you could still maybe open an app on it, but it won't run under Catalina anymore. Conrad. It goes 64 will identify them, but it won't let you delete them.
Yeah, and I typically, when I, I, would, I would do an upgrade like this or something where you have to get rid of a lot of apps, I never try to sit down and do it all at once. But once in a while, if I'm going to the application look forward folder and looking for some item, and I notice that above it there are three 32-bit apps, I'll just delete them as I go. Because depending on if you have hundreds of apps, it could be a nightmare to try to sit down and do it and frustrate you. But if you do a few here and a few there, is my experience. Yeah, but also, the uninstalled items are 32-bit apps. So Right, so you simply have to delete them. And if you hold down Command Option Delete, it'll delete it immediately. And I'll cover that in my next week's Tips and tip, Tricks class. Six ways to delete out of options from the items from the Finder. So a week from today, that, that tip will be available. So with system preferences now, as in Mojave, Mac OS updates are shown in the system preferences instead of the app store. So you'll see a software update icon available in system preferences. So this is the new Catalina system preferences screen. So you'll know that you'll notice that it's changed quite a bit from the prior system preferences in Mojave and earlier. But it's really easy to find your software updates. They're in the third row down, the first item. Again, if you click on software update, you'll get notices that will tell you whether your Mac is up to date like this, or it might say an update is available and there'll be an option there to upgrade now or download the update. Again, system preferences has changed a little bit. One of the things you'll notice is at the top of the page, you have a new section. You'll see my name there. It says Apple ID, iCloud Media and App Stores. To the right of that, you'll see Apple ID and family sharing. So this is new. This kind of used to be down under an iCloud section. You'd have to go down to iCloud and then navigate to your different services. Now it's all into one button there. So you, when you click on the Apple ID button there, you'll see it in four sections. You'll see an overview, name, phone, and email, password and security, payment and shipping, iCloud, and media and purchases. So the overview just says one account for everything you do with Apple. That's just an introduction screen. The next screen is your name, phone, and email. This is all the contact information that they have on file for you. Your phone numbers, your emails that are associated with your messages, your iCloud and such. You can also check your notification preferences from Apple at the bottom there. Do you want to get announcements from Apple? Do you want to get apps and movie suggestions? Do you want to get Apple news updates? So you can uncheck those if you're getting too much email from Apple right from this system preferences pane. You don't have to go and unsubscribe or anything. If you don't want to get any more email from Apple, you can uncheck these boxes. The next session is password and security. So we'll tell you here, your Apple ID. It'll give you an option to change your password. It tells you when the last password change was. It tells you if you have two-factor authentication on. It tells you how many trusted phone numbers you have. So rather than going to iCloud and then my account and have to go to an Apple web page and do all this, it's right in system preferences now. This used to be a combination of system preferences and an internet web page to see all this different data. You'd have to go to Apple's Apple ID page for your account, sign in there, use two-factor authentication, and now it's all tied into system preferences. If you're signed into your machine, you can see this stuff. The next section is payment and shipping. So you have your payment method on there. You have your Apple cash balance. You have your Apple card balance. You have your shipping address. And then you go down to your iCloud section, which used to be a, sep a separate system preference pane panel that said iCloud. Now it's all tied into this Apple ID panel. So that's where you have your iCloud Drive, all your other stuff. Now, typically I would have all this selected, but I'm using my wife's laptop and she's running out of space. So I didn't turn on all my photos and everything. But typically, if you have multiple devices, you wanna have all these boxes checked so that your calendars, your address book, your photos, your Safari, your reminders will be on all your devices. This isn't my primary device, so I didn't have all those checked for that. Media and purchases. You can here check, do you want to require downloads for, or passwords for free downloads? Do you want to require passwords for 
in-app purchases. You can turn on Touch ID here. If you have a Mac or, uh, well, it would just be a Mac laptop at this point that had Touch ID where you can put your finger in there to authenticate, you can turn that on for purchases on this screen. So rather than having to put in your password, you can just put your finger down like you do on your iPhone 8 or earlier or your new iPhone that you do with Face ID. You can just look at your phone and process a transaction at Walgreens. That, they bring that same ease to here with the Touch ID if you have a model that's compatible. So back to system preferences, most everything is uh, kind of organized the same. You'll see a, a few new things here that we'll cover. So one of the things is in Catalina, there's a new dark mode setting. So in Mojave, you had a choice at the top, dark mode or light mode. It's so like if you notice, this screen is in dark mode. This screen is in light mode. In Catalina, because a lot of people like to use light mode during the day and maybe dark mode at night, and then Catalina now has an auto section where at sundown, it'll switch to dark mode if you wanted to. I tend to keep dark mode on all my devices all the time. I like the way it looks, but that's a preference like Coke or Pepsi and there's no right or wrong. You pick the view you like, but if you want it to change automatically, that's a new setting in Catalina where you can click auto instead of just light or dark all the time, like a light switch. It'll, it'll do it automatically for you. You can search system preferences a lot better now for a topic or setting. So if you were going to search for track pad, I typed in the word track. I've got all these options for mouse sensitivity, mouse pointer to locate, advertising settings. That's another way that you can control tracking on your computer. So I was looking for the track pad, but since I typed in the word track, they give me all these other options, enable closed captioning and subtitles. So the search has gotten a lot better. So if you're looking for system preferences for language and you don't see a button that says language, it'll point you to the right place and highlight it. There, how uh, accessibility and screen time are highlighted and security preferences, security and privacy. Those are because those are the buttons that apply to the term you searched for. So if you're searching for something and you don't, you forgot where the mouse settings were or something, you can type in the word mouse and it'll show you the options for that. You have a lot more control over permission services now. So what'll happen is you'll notice that your Mac, after you install Catalina and you want to use open table, your, to make an airline or a restaurant reservation, <coughs> Your computer now, Safari will ask you specifically, it'll pop up a box. Do you want open table to be able to know your location? And then it will say, to do this, you must go to security and privacy and manually allow open table to know your location. I don't know if open table actually does that. That was the, but you'll see certain apps, like if you're using Dropbox, you're going to be prompted now to manually tell your computer that Dropbox has access to your entire disk. So you have to give it full disk access. I'll cover that process in a few seconds because that's something you'll see for backup programs like Backblaze or Crash Plan or Dropbox. Things that need to access your hard drive, you're gonna have to specifically give each of them a key to your computer. So they can't operate until you go into system preferences and add them as an allowed program. So that's a lot more secure than just kind of allowing things to manage your disks and such. But for example, in location services, Siri and dictation is handy, weather is handy, maps is handy, spotlight might be handy. You might not want Facebook in that list, you know, so you can uncheck Facebook from knowing where your location is because they're an advertising company and they care about where you are. Full disk access. So Terminal iMazing is a program that I use to back up voicemails and text messages from my phone to a hard copy on my computer. That needs full disk access to my iPhone to be able to access that stuff. So that's why I've checked that here because I installed that program on, com on my computer so I could connect my iPhone and save the voicemails. And I had to grant the computer full disk access to my iPhone. And I had to go in and manually check that. Most of this software will tell you to operate, you need to enable full disk access and it will, sh it will show you little pictures that guide you through these steps. Open system preferences, go to security and privacy, go to files and folders on the left here. 
and then check the programs that you want to allow. So most software that needs this kind of access will walk you through this process that I'm going through that says, hey, I have to enable full disk access for Dropbox or 1Password or give 1Password access to my downloads folder. So in recent iterations of iOS and Mac OS, Apple has begun to ramp up security both behind the scenes and in plain sight. So Catalina allows for individual microphone and camera access, in addition to more granular permissions for applications across the board. So with hacking and security being on the news on a daily basis, and you're seeing this all the time on the news, you're hearing about it from your friends, it's in the newspapers and the magazines, security, somebody else was hacked this person got $70,000 taken out of their account. You know, it's nice to have more minute control over your data and information. So the Mac OS technology includes a technology called Gatekeeper that's designed to ensure that only trusted software runs on your Mac. So the safest place overall to get apps for your Mac or MacBook or, or laptop or computer is through the Mac App Store. Those have always been signed, they haven't been tampered with. And if there's ever a problem with one of those software programs, Apple can pull it off the store and notify you. So it's, it's not like a program that was uh, developed by Adobe and you can only get it from Adobe. And if Adobe's website got hacked and somebody messed with it, that could filter down to you and, and ruin your system or cause you some headache. So the safest place if you can get something is through the App Store. And a lot of apps are available both on the App Store and on the manufacturer's website. But my, my rule of thumb is I go to the App Store first to see if it's there. If not, you have to download it from Adobe. You'll be prompted to, this is an app un, I downloaded from an unidentified developer. Are you sure you wanna open it? You have to click open, then you have to hit install, and then you have to put in your password. So you're not gonna accidentally download a bad app. So if, you're, if you see some messages like that that say, uh, you have to authenticate that you want to open this app and you just didn't do anything, just cancel out of that because that's more suspicious. So even if you download and install apps from the internet, the Mac OS continues to protect your Mac. So when you Mac OS checks the developer ID signature to verify that the software is from an identified developer and that it hasn't been tampered with. So Catalina also requires the software to be notarized. So each program has to be kind of notarized like you would get a statement notarized so that you can be confident that it doesn't contain known malware. Before opening downloaded software for the first time, Mac OS requests your approval to make sure you aren't misled into running software that you didn't expect. So that's kind of what I was just talking about. So if you want to review the app security settings on your Mac, you can go to security privacy and the general page. So the general pane there, and then you'll have options that say require password five minutes after screensaver. But at the bottom, you can choose allow apps downloaded from the app store or the app store and identify developers, which I chose here. So people that have identified embedded by Apple are identified developers. If you choose only the app store, you wouldn't be able to download any other software without authenticating two or three times for your own security. So that's where you can change those settings on what you're gonna get warned about. If you choose App Store and identify developers, you have to put your password in to install it, but you won't have to necessarily go through other hoops to install that software. So if you do get a developer signed or notarized app, you'll see a, a message like this that says, example app is an app downloaded from the internet. Are you sure you want to open it? Safari downloaded the file today at 9.41 a.m. Apple checked it for malicious software and none was detected. So typically when you do a download, you'll see something like this and you'll just hit open. Now sometimes you'll see a warning message that says, this app cannot be open because it was not downloaded from the App Store. Your security preferences allow installation of only apps from the App Store. So on the prior screen, if you had that only App Store app checked, this is the warning you would see if you tried to install an app. So the, the way you have to open those is go to the show and finder button, right click the app and go to open or go to file open, and then the app will open and install. But if you double click it, this message is gonna keep coming up. 
So you have to open it with command O or right click and say open or go to file open to open it kind of through the back door to proceed if you see this message. Now, if you set your app to the second choice, App Store and Identify Developers, like you saw that I had, you'll see a warning that just say that the app was not notarized. So they're saying this cannot be open because the developer cannot be verified. Mac OS cannot verify that this app is free from malware. So you may want to look for an updated version of the app or look for an alternative if you see this message, because this message is basically telling you, it's not really giving you any options to, own, to open it even. It's just telling you, hey, this, is, this might be suspicious. We're not gonna let you open it. You could still overwrite this manually, going to file open or command O or right clicking and saying open the file. But if you see this message, it's probably not safe to do that. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Should you move it to trash or cancel it? Move it to trash. Okay. Just delete it. That's going to be a, a road you don't want to get to go down. So when you see that, just move it to the trash because otherwise it's going to pop up again. So it'll, it'll keep kind of pestering you. So if they actually detect a malicious app that has malicious content, they will tell you a more scarier warning. This app will damage your computer. You should move it to the trash. And there's the button there that's the default. It says move to trash. And there's a checkbox that says report malware to Apple. I don't know who reviews that, but they'll probably put it in a tally and say, oh, this many people downloaded this app. You know, I don't, I don't know if anyone really pays attention to it, but it doesn't hurt to leave it checked. So if they see something that's really efficient, you're going to see this warning. And your only option is going to be to move to trash. You couldn't overwrite this warning because the, the software won't let you. So again, if you're certain that an app that you want to install is from a trustworthy source and hasn't been tampered with, you can temporarily override your Mac security settings to open it. So again, you can check if you get an app, say you know that uh, this HP update is legitimate, but they haven't had it signed by Apple yet. You know, HP rushed it to their website, but didn't clear it with Apple. So Apple's going to say, this app is not approved. It'll, and then HP will try to install. Apple will say, this app is not approved. Go to the security settings to, to install it. And then you'll see this message. At the bottom there, you see, example app was blocked from use because it is, it is not from an identified developer. You can choose open anyway at that point because you know that you trust this HP product. Apple just hadn't vetted it yet for some reason. You know it's safe. So you could, they give you the option and they take you directly to this page where you can say open anyway. So that's a nice little shortcut that they put in to help you bypass the settings if you have your settings for App Store and identified developers. You'll get the option to open it anyway. So the warning prompt after you click open anyway will appear. And then again, you can click open. So they're telling you that this could be harmful, but you know in your heart that it's a legitimate program and you need it right now. So that's okay. But so you'll have an open there and you also still have the option to move it to the trash. And then that HP app will now be saved in this exception to your security settings. And you can open it in the future by double clicking it. Once you told it to open it anyway, it remembers you said that was safe. So after you've gone through these steps, in the future, for updates of that particular app, you won't need to do this every time. But for different apps, you may. So occasionally, an app will request full disk access when it needs to access the entire contents of your hard drive. So common apps that request this are backup apps like Carbon Copy Clone or Super Duper and Backblaze, some file sharing apps like Dropbox. So Apple requires that you do confirm this access. These are the steps that I'm gonna show you to follow when you wanna do full disk access. So you'll open system preferences and then the security and privacy panel. You'll have to click the lock at the bottom left to make changes. And then you'll enter your password You'll select unlock, and then you'll hit the plus sign. So we're in the full disk access on the bottom left. We're gonna add a program to be able to have full disk access.
So then when you go to full disk access, it'll take you to your applications folder where you can click on a Dropbox. That will appear in the list and you can put a check mark in front of the app that you want to allow full disk access and in that way you can operate correctly. Most of these apps with Catalina will tell you, hey, you can't open Dropbox until you enable full disk access. So unless you do this, put it into full disk access and check the box in front of it, you won't be able to use the program because you've got to approve it before it's enabled. Yes, Lynn? If someone sent you a photo from a wedding, a batch of photos, and you just want to look at it on your computer, you won't need to do this. If you want to install Dropbox to store things on your own, you'll have to enable full disk access. <laughs> it's all or nothing. I don't think Dropbox is nefarious and they want to steal your data, but if you're security conscious, you may want to think about whether you give Dropbox all that access. I've been trying to use iCloud Drive for more storage because I think Apple's got a better security protocol in place than anyone in general. So for storage, I've been trying to use iCloud Drive. We'll talk about iCloud folder sharing later, um, and that'll give iCloud Drive more Dropbox style. You can put 100 wedding photos in a folder, right click, share it with 10 people that were at the wedding, and boom, it's done. Uh, Dropbox still makes that easy. iCloud is not there yet with the iCloud Drive feature, and I'll talk about that a little later. But full disk access, it's kind of like when you, you get presented with this, you'll know whether you need it or not. It's going to be some program that needs access to the whole computer, which will be some kind of backup program. Dropbox wants that, even though they may not need it. So you'll kind of have to weigh, you know, you want that, it's like a big scale. And on one side is privacy, and on this side is convenience. The more privacy you have, the less convenience you have. The more convenience you have, the less privacy. So everybody has a different balance for their own personal stuff. Find that balance for you, and it might mean the Dropbox doesn't make the cut, and you'll just use it through the website. You, know, you don't have to have Dropbox on your com computer to use it. You can go to dropbox.com, access your files, upload files directly there. It's never really on your computer. It's on Dropbox's computer in North Carolina or wherever it is. So if you use the cloud version, you won't have to mess with this. It's only when you install the Dropbox program on your computer, that you'll have to give it full disk access. So that's about all that we have for system preferences. One of the other new things in Catalina is they've really improved the notes app. So the notes app is a common app between the iOS devices and your computers. So you'll see notes on your iPhone, you'll see notes on your iPad, you'll see notes on your MacBook, your iMac, your, your uh, Mac Pro, any of your Apple devices, you'll see notes on. And it's nice because you can put ideas in there while you're sitting at the doctor's office, and then when you get home, they're on your computer. So it syncs kind of like your address book and your other things do. So now with Notes in Mac OS 10.15, they've got a built-in document scanner that can search text and recognize objects and images. You can put information like maps, photos into notes. You can invite people to view notes or to be an editor on notes. So you can share notes with people and they can have view only access or edit access. You can also start to use tables, checklists, and text styles in notes. So what's new in notes? So you'll see these different text styles. So when you go to the format menu, you'll have a title format, a heading, a subheading, body, numbered, monospace, bulleted list, numbered list. So notes almost becomes like a text editing, you know, like a word processing type entry of these, of these notes. You have a lot of control over them. So the new formatting options, you can now add bullets, dash, and number checklists. You can add tables to notes. Reminders is also another app that changes its look and functionality. It's got a brand new interface. It's got more edit buttons. It's got a smart list for organizing reminders across categories. You can customize the list in, in order to categorize. 
You can add attachments to reminders, messages to reminders, web pages to a reminder. And if you use Siri, you can search for reminders and notes a little better with voice. So the Reminders app has been completely rebuilt with an all-new user interface and more powerful features. You can add dates, times, locations, or flags to Reminders using the new edit buttons without having to go to another menu or view, especially on your iPhone or iPad where there's not as much screen real estate as with the computer. So Reminders will understand and provide suggestions with Siri intelligence on your device. So you can add attachments, scan documents, or web links that take you directly to a website related to the reminder. And the smart list will organize your reminders in an easy to find categories like today, flag, scheduled, or all to see them in a single list. So one of the neat things about notes and reminders are when you go to your share function. Yes, ma'am. I just have a question. Yes. Um, I never used reminders. I use my calendar all the time. Mm -hmm. What's a good I mean, personally, I use my calendar for appointments. I use reminders for things like a shopping list. I have a Costco reminder. I have a Whole Foods reminder. I have a Publix reminder. And with the reminders, you can add items to the list, milk, bread, eggs, tofu, whatever you want. And they have little bullet points in front of them. So when you pick that up, if it's a shared reminder with my wife, we both share the Publix list. So if I go there and get eggs and milk, I can tap them off and they disappear from the list. And she knows that she still needs to get bread because I didn't get it. So that's a benefit of reminders rather than notes. Notes is kind of just like blocks of text and maybe a photo. Reminders actually let you create checklists and you can even show the completed reminders and say, oh, what did I get at Publix two weeks ago? If you say show completed, it'll show you all the ones you've marked off. So I use reminders for books to read, things I hear about on the radio and I wanna read a book. I have a books to read reminder, uh, movies to watch. So you can create reminders for all kinds of checklist type items. Yes, sir. Can you print it out notes? You can print notes. I, I don't think you can print reminders, but I haven't tried. Notes? Notes you can print. I mean, all in the group. You can't print all the notes. You can print a single note at a time. You can't print a, a list of notes because I think I have over 800 notes now. I don't know what the limit is, but I've got a lot of notes and I, I can't, if you had three notes, I can see how you might want to print all notes, but I don't think there's any way to print because all notes, you can print a single note at a time. I know. Yes. And, and Catalina, you can do a whole lot more under notes and, and, and reminders. Again, I've never used either, but how is that going to transfer then to say your cell phone? Well, the notes and reminders have been upgraded on iOS 13 as well. So the first time you actually use reminders on one of your devices, say you have an iPad and an iPhone and a MacBook, and you've upgraded to Catalina on your MacBook, it, and you open reminders. The first time you open it on any one of your devices, it's going to say, hey, do you want to update to the new reminders, it's new and improved. But if you update, it'll say in the small print, if you update on this device, you won't be able to read this on your iPad and your iPhone until you update those to iOS 13. So all the devices have to be on the same page or the reminders don't match and sync. And you'll be warned of that the first time you upgrade the reminders on one device. So the first time you open reminders on your phone, your iPad or your computer, after you've updated to either Catalina or iOS 13, there will be a little window that pops up that says, get the all new reminders, but you're going to have to do this on all your devices to make sure they sync. So if you've updated reminders on your iPhone and iPad running iOS 13, but you haven't installed Catalina yet, these features aren't available on your computer. It's working fine between your portable devices, but your computer, since it doesn't have Catalina, can't take advantage of the new reminders, for example. You can also customize the appearance of your lists and reminders. There's 12 new colors and 60 symbols. You can use emoji and little, well, not really emoji, but little symbols like little airplanes and little icons that you can insert. And also messages integration. So let's say you, you tag someone in a reminder 
and I say, oh, we've got to go see that new movie or something, and I send it to my wife, and I, I put her name in the reminder, next time I'm talking with her in messages, I'll get a little pop-up that says, oh, do you want a reminder about that movie now? So you can put a reminder in reminders that's based on location, time, or person. And the next time that time rolls around or you're at that location or you're talking with that person, that reminder will activate and say, hey, you're at Publix, get cat litter. You know, if you say, next time I'm at Publix, tell me to get cat litter, the Siri. Next time she senses that you're at a Publix, it'll pop up, cat litter, you know, or whatever. So reminders can be location, time, or person based. So next time that person enters a conversation, the reminder will appear. So it's really powerful and something you can play with, and I think you'll, you'll catch on really quickly. So there are three primary ways to create new reminders. So in the reminder app, you'll have different lists like Publix, Costco, Petco, whatever. You can tap the list you wanna add a reminder to, or you can tap add list at the top to create a new list of reminders, like Sam's Club. And then you can tap the new, the plus sign at the top. You write your reminder and tap done. And then you can ask Siri to set up reminders. So if you have a home or work address and contacts, Siri will understand location-based reminders. You can also ask Siri to remind you about this while within another app. And via the share pane, this is new, you can set reminders from within other apps. So when you tap the share button, when you normally see mail, messages, airdrop, you'll now see reminders. So whether it's a web page or a photo, you can add it directly to a reminder with the share button now, which is new. And then you can also choose, say it's a picture of something, a plant you needed to pick up or something that you had, and you can take a picture of the plant on the Home Depot website, add it to your reminders. And when you create the reminder, you can say Saturday at 2 p.m., remind me of this. And on Saturday at 2 p.m., you'll see the picture of the plant you're supposed to pick up. And it started in the Photos app. So this is the way the Reminders window looks like. So you see I have a, my list over on the left, I've got just a Reminders list and a Publix list in this case. So you, the Add List button is at the bottom left. So if you want to add a new list for Costco or for Walgreens, you can add a list there. And then on the right, in the right window, is my Publix list itself. There's a plus sign at the top right of that where I can add a new item. Cat litter, for example, at the bottom of that. And then when you enter a item, you'll have a little information button there that you can then say, it'll tell you where you created the reminder, but then you can actually say, remind me on a certain day or at a location or add notes that include a person's name that needs to know about the eggs. And then the next time you're at that address or that that 11 o'clock on Monday rolls around, a little pop box pops up, hey, get eggs at Publix. So, I don't know. Do you have to create that list every time you go shopping or can you create a Costco list that you just pick, 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 pick? what you want to pick up. Yeah, I have an ongoing Publix list and a Costco list and a Whole Foods list. And it just, you just keep on the same list, but as you check things, they disappear from the list. And then once you have a removed, see the button that says at the top where it says completed, hide? Yeah. That might say, I've got uh, five items here. It might say 52 completed. And you can either hide or show you're completed. You can show the completed. So if I said, if I had a lot of completed there and I, I, I'm browsing through my completed list, you can say show the completed items. And I say, oh, wine. If you put a checkbox on wine, it goes back to the top of the list. So you don't really have to add eggs every week. You can just go to the eggs that you did last week and tap it again and it will become active and go to the top of the list. So if there's things that you, you know, get often, you don't have to type them in every time. You can just show the completed items scroll down, tap the eggs, and it'll go back to the top of the active items. Bob? When you click, uh, I'll show you that in a second. Yeah, we haven't gotten to that yet, but it'll, it'll show in a second. Yes, ma'am. So for your input, are you using Titan or Siri? 
on my iOS device, I use Siri more. Hey Siri, add sugar to my reminders, public reminder. Somebody's. You'll have to continue. <laughs> so that, sorry about that. Yeah, but uh, but the, I do it most of that with my phone. With my computer, I actually type it in. I don't use Siri as much on my laptop or desktop as I do on my iPad and iPhone. It's just not as I'm not as intuitive with Siri on here yet. I can't. I haven't started using it much on my computer yet. Yes. It'll identify it by the location of the publics that you normally go to, I think. I always go to the Vineyards Publix, and when I'm at that Publix, it always tells me. But I'm at the, if I'm at the Publix on 41, it, my reminders don't pop up. So I think you'd have to create a reminder for each Publix Vineyards, Publix Crossroads, Publix 41, whatever. You'd have to name, if you wanted the location-based, you'd have to create a location for each Publix. The easiest way to do that is when you're at that Publix. If you say, the next time I'm here, remind me to do this, that'll create a location-based zone for that reminder. If you say, next time I'm here, because if you say, next time at Publix, it seems to only remember the Publix I go to most often. I must have created a, a, an item there, and it knew I was in Publix, because it doesn't happen when I go to other Publix. And I only have one Publix list, and I'm just used to looking at it when I get to Publix, no matter what Publix I go to. The location base might be better if you, uh, maybe you drop off some dry cleaning. When you're leaving, you say, hey, Siri, remind me next time I'm here to pick up my dry cleaning. That way, next time at the location of that dry cleaner, it's going to say, hey, pick up your shirt. So if you create the reminder at a location, if it's not a known location, like your, if you have your home or your office in your phone or something, if it's at a location that you might want to return to, if you create the reminder while you're at that location and say, next time I'm here or in two weeks when I'm here, remind me to do something or remind me about this or there's a sale going on, next time you're at that specific geographic spot is when the notification will come up. But just a generic Publix list does not, I don't think it knows all the Publixes yet. So it doesn't quite work. So again, you can add notes. You can go on a day. You can be reminded when you arrive or leave a location. And then, oh, so the sharing item, let's go back to that. So when you go into a reminder, let me escape here for a moment. Okay, so if I go to reminders, so here's my Catalina class reminder. So if I click on an item and click info, I'm gonna try to type in my wife's name in the notes. So I can add a location, I can add a date. Do tomorrow, information. Notes. So it has my name in there. Add image. So these are the different options. Oh, there's the shared button. So let's see how I did that. See, it's my publish list is shared with my wife, and there's her phone number. That's a new item. On your phone, there's a add people. So if you click on the list in the list view, as you see the left column. There's an option at the bottom to add people. On your phone, there's a little share button, but on your computer, there's no share button. So 
on your Mac, if you click on a list like the Costco list and you say add people, it'll then present you whether you can mail, airdrop, or send a message to a person you want to invite to have access to that list. Now, when you give someone access to a reminder, they can mark milk off your Publix list or toilet paper off your Costco list and you, you won't see it again. It'll be in the completed, but it won't be in the active items. So that's the benefit of sharing a reminders list is that if you have two people that are going to different places and maybe picking stuff up, if one person picks up paper towels, the other person doesn't get them too. You know, so that's one way that sharing a reminder. So you have to share a reminder from the reminder list rather than from the reminder itself. On the phone and iPad, you can share the reminder from the reminder itself. But on the computer, you have to control click or right click on the list and then add people. So this is a general tip. It's a new uh, tip for the, just a finder in general. All the windows now, you can tile finder and app windows. So when you hover over your buttons at the top, you'll see that little icon appear on the green button that usually maximizes the screen. So if you just click it once, it'll maximize the screen and make it big to cover the screen like it used to. But if you press and hold on it for a moment, You'd be able to enter full screen, move that window to the left or the right, or even shoot that window over to your iPad through the sidecar feature that we'll talk about soon. So if you have an iPad running iOS 13 and it's sitting next to your laptop and you're doing something and you want to move that window over there so you can do something else on your iPad, if you have that option, uh, an iPad running iOS 13, you'll be able to move that window over to your iPad right there and kind of split desktop. So that's a new feature that it used to just make it bigger, make it small, the green dot. Now you can actually move it over to the left side so it'll cover the left half of your screen. So it, it's an easy way to split screens. If you want to use a web page on one side of your screen and an email, a mail page on the right, Rather than having to have one overlap the other and jump back and forth between the windows, you can have them kind of split the real estate there on two different sides and there will be a divider between them that you can slide them back and forth to give one more space than the other. So one of the things that's happened with Catalina is, if you've noticed, uh, iTunes has been replaced with three separate apps for music, podcasts and shows or movies. So the iTunes music store where songs can individually be purchased for download is still going to be available. So it's not like you're having to, having to all of a sudden subscribe to something now that these services are split. So you've got it right. iThings is a thing of the past. So nothing that was previously on iTunes is going to be disappeared from your Mac. All the music you bought over from CDs years ago, all the music you bought is still going to be there. It's just the music is going to be in the music app, the movies are going to be in the TV app, and the podcasts are going to be in a separate podcast app. So they've kind of segregated the different kinds of media, but you haven't lost anything. Your existing media, movies, music that you've downloaded, home movies that you made, will just be in a different app now with Catalina. Yes, sir. Where will you go to back up? That's, we'll cover that, but it's a little, that's a little, they, they changed that process as well. By default, your uh, phone now should be set to an iCloud backup. Because the, the way that you've, you used to be able to plug it in and back it up to iTunes, the, your phone doesn't show up in iTunes anymore. So I'm going to show you where your phone showed up. But typically you should have your phone backing up to the cloud. And that means that you may need to purchase more space than the standard five gigabytes. But depending on the space, you might have to pay 99 cents a month or, or a little more. But they're, they're trying to get away from having to depend on the computer because so many people now don't use a machine anymore. They just use an iPad and an iPhone. So the, the need for having a computer to sync and back up is kind of diminishing quickly. So these are what the three new apps look like in your doc. So you just had used to have one app that kind of looked like a musical note, and that was all, all this stuff together. 
you know, TV shows and podcasts within the music app. Now you've got three distinct apps in your dock after this. So the music is all the music you've downloaded, purchased, or imported from your own CDs is there. Podcasts, both available podcasts that you've downloaded in your subscriptions and the whole podcast directory is in that area. And then TV shows, and this includes home movies that you've imported, movies that you've purchased, rented, are all there. They just kind of moved to different locations. So the music app. The music app is designed for Apple Music, which is a subscription service to stream more than 60 million songs ad-free. So every time you open the app, you'll get the best in music available, but that's also $10 a month. Uh, the music store. If you want to buy your music and you want to buy the new Hamilton soundtrack, you can just go to the music store and buy it for 12 bucks. Uh, now playing is a section you'll see. So that, that's an updated player. So you can now see the lyrics while you're listening. There's a little lyrics button like you may have noticed on your iPhone or an iPad. In your library, all the stuff that you've had, uh, they, it's a little easier to find. So there's a new sidebar. You can search a lot easier, find a song or an artist that you're looking for quickly. The TV app allows you to buy or rent new release movies over 100,000 available, including the largest catalog of 4K titles. Uh, Apple TV Plus is a new subscription service that if you bought a new iPhone or iPad or computer in the past three months, you've gotten a year of Apple Plus for free, but it's normally only $5 a month for Apple's own original content that's streaming like Netflix and Hulu do. So Apple's got their own channels, their own programs now so you can pay $5 a month to get more content with all your free time. Yes, sir. Well, your iTunes should have been there prior to Catalina and all your music and movies should be there. <laughs> And do you subscribe to any services like Apple Match or? Yeah. So Apple, iTunes Match for $25 a year will let you kind of keep the same music on your computer on your iPad. And depending on what you've downloaded onto your device, because music takes up a lot of space, you may not have your whole entire library. And that might be why you're not seeing it when you're away from Wi-Fi. But is it your laptop that's away from Wi-Fi or your device? Yeah, your iPhone, unless you specifically tell the iPhone to download the music, you might not have it if you're on a plane or something. So you have to kind of pre-plan. Unless you only have 2,000 songs, you won't be able to fit them all on your phone. Like if you have 20,000, you might have to pick and choose playlists or artists. In my question, people that don't use Catalina, Catalina makes that easy. Well, it's Catalina. It, the, the subscription services make it a little easier. I mean, like iTunes Match is a service that you can get from Apple that for $25 a year, it syncs all your music that you bought with all your devices without plugging anything in. You used to have to plug it into your computer, transfer playlists, transfer music. It's not any easier. It's just presented differently, I think. So I don't think you're going to, you're not going to gain any, unless you subscribe to a service, you're not going to gain any music or content. But for, we pay $10 a month to Apple Music and then you get whatever you want. You know, you want to listen to the new Gate Lady Gaga or the Hamilton soundtrack or some Bob Marley. It just plays instantly. You can download it to your device. But as soon as you quit paying the 10 bucks a month, that song's going to disappear from your device. So, yes. I think Max has gotten all the $25 a year. Can you share that with like your husband or? Only if you share the entire music account. iTunes Match is per Apple ID. So if you and your husband share an Apple ID, the iTunes Match will be common with you. But otherwise, each Apple ID needs their own iTunes Match to sync their music with their devices that share that Apple ID. Do you also have an iTunes subscriber and have iTunes Match? iTunes Match is a standalone service. It's Match, M-A-T-C-H. And the only way to get to iTunes Match is to go into the iTunes store and at the bottom of the window with all the different <coughs> options, you'll see a section that says iTunes Match. They don't really promote it. 
but it's the easiest way to sync your existing content with all your, your different devices. So, yes? If all your devices back up to iCloud and you have your music on your, your hard drive or whatever, wouldn't that automatically then show up on, on your phone or your iPad? Only if you have iTunes Match or subscribe to iTunes Music because music, music files are larger and they don't, they don't automatically sync all of them unless usually you have to pay for that. The nice thing about it is if you're, if you're subscribing to iTunes Match or iTunes Music, which is $10 a month, that media doesn't count against your iCloud quota. Like your 200 gigs of iCloud space, that's just your photos and your documents. Your music doesn't play into that if you're paying Apple for some kind of service, either iTunes Match or iCloud Music, iTunes so Music. I'm already paying for two terabytes of backup space for iCloud, why should I have to? Because your music really doesn't work. I think it's the record companies that are uptight about people stealing music still or something. There's some kind of licensing or copyright where they can't put your music with your iCloud storage. Like the record companies don't allow it still. They're still paranoid, I think. But yeah, your music doesn't really work that way unless you pay for some kind of syncing service or do it manually. If you plug your phone into your computer, you can transfer all the music with a wire, mm -hmm. but you cannot any longer uh, put music like on the cloud unless you're paying for some extra service. And I think it's because of the copyright, the uptight legal things. So, Don? Every year of the $5 a month thing, does that start when you buy your device or when you first buy a new device? It starts after you buy a new device, it starts when you activate the subscription on an iPad or your Apple TV. So, like, my wife and I just got new iPhones, but since we're on a family plan, there was no way to let, like, it run for two years. Like we're in the same family. So we both started watching Apple TV and in 12 months, we're going to have to start paying five bucks for it, but we got it free for the first year, but it runs concurrently, not consecutively or after another. So that's the only bad thing about it. But if you get any new device, they give you a year of this free, which is a $60 value. So. Yeah, no, any content, movies or music? Yeah, any music that you brought in from CDs or discs or something, you still own that. It's on your computer probably. Whether it's on your phone would depend either if you're using a cable to transfer, which we'll cover a little later, or subscribing to a service that will sync it all for you in the background. But you're not gonna lose any of your existing content and music that you spent years putting together. Right. You have to then be careful where that music is played or that streaming is played because that's. Right. And that's another licensing thing with music. Like if you're making an iMovie and you want to put somewhere over the rainbow as the music, YouTube won't let you play it. You know, so you have to be, that's a, these music companies are still really uptight about all this because this stuff is still happening. And so, yeah, you have to be cautious with music that you might want to put publicly because of all this licensing and stuff. They might just say, you're not going to be able to show that video because the soundtrack is copyrighted. So even if you own it, you can't use it. You could use it in a personal video that you show in your house, but you could not put it on YouTube for the public without paying those people something. But you always own that. Another question on Apple TV. Yes. I quite understand. I have two Apple TVs, but now they're coming out with another app. Well, Apple TVs are hardware devices. They're like a little black square hockey puck that connects to your television and lets you access some streaming content. They, I think they just came out with a new Apple TV hardware device that has Dolby Atmos sound or something that, that has 16 speaker capability for the ceiling and the floor and all around you, but that's the only, and it might support higher than 4K resolution, a new Apple TV device if it's out, but. I wouldn't necessarily replace my Apple TV device until I get a new TV because unless it's really old, the Apple TVs are going to be able to be updated. 
But unless you bought a 6K TV, you might need the new 6K Apple TV to take well, advantage of that. Why I transferred to the graphics, but now I'm finding that I'm like on the newer one you can watch it but on the yeah so some apple tvs like other devices might reach a limit to which they can be updated to show some content just like if you have an older iphone it might not run the new words with friends because it's just not compatible and that iphone can't handle the software so you'll occasionally run into those issues where your hardware uh, isn't supported anymore and at that time if you want to access Fox station in your bedroom for example you might have to upgrade the TV, Apple TV the unit way around it to put it, like I can talk to my TV I can talk to my computer and take it to the TV program right you can always airplay it but then uh, I found that to just it's, it's a more of a pain yeah right. so I, but you can still you can stop the stress I'm sorry yeah Okay, so let's go to, we can, but that's the, the nutshell. So you can also buy or rent movies. You can find your, all your purchased movies and shows in the updated library tab. There are new channels with Apple TV, including HBO, Stars, and Showtime. If you have family sharing, come on, you can share this with up to six family, six family members. <coughs> channels play in the Apple TV app, ad free, online or off, no additional apps or passwords needed. So for this HBO and Showtime and SARS, they're not free with the Apple TV, but they are available and at a price that's competitive with the price you'd be paying for HBO with your cable company. So you don't have to pay both your cable company for HBO if you're using it on your Apple TV. You would just subscribe to HBO on your Apple TV for $14 a month and cancel your account with Comcast. And you'll just use your Apple TV and your devices to access HBO from that point forward. There's a new kids section, uh, Apple TV everywhere. That means that your iPad, your iPhone, some smart TVs, I was just at a client's house yesterday, they had Apple TV software built into their smart TV and they didn't even have an Apple TV connected, but they could get all the content that you would with an Apple TV. And I'd heard about that, but I hadn't seen it yet. And this new Dolby speaker system that has ceiling floor and all your walls covered is supported with the new Apple TV hardware. Now, the podcast app, the third of the trifecta of the new media, uh, iTunes, movies, and uh, podcasts, has listed now. So you can, it'll recommend shows that might be based on the ones you've already liked and listening to. Better search results. The podcast library is all the shows that you've traditionally subscribed to or added, organized by title or episode. You can search that easily. And there's over 70,000 podcasts available now. So media syncing, all three services, Apple TV, Apple Music, and Podcast, sync your content through the cloud across your devices, or you can still sync it using a cable, and I'll, I'll review that in a few seconds. So all the music you've downloaded, purchased, or imported from your CDs is in music. The podcast is available and subscriptions are there. TV shows is both the online content and all TV shows you've purchased, rented, or imported are available. So some of the, this is the new Apple TV Plus, which will be covered in a, another meeting, but this is some of what the screens look like, some of the shows that are available. This is the Watch Now screen with all the stuff that's streaming now, movies that they're promoting, TV shows, kids. And then when you get to your library, that's all your content. So these are all the movies that I bought. There's recently added, there are, uh, genres on the left that you can scroll down. So this is all the movies that you've bought traditionally. Another new feature that's really been improved with Catalina is voice control. So this isn't so much Siri or dictation as it is for people uh, that maybe have limited mobility that can't type to control their computer. So voice control is Apple's brand new system for controlling your Mac with just your voice. And it's also available in iOS 13 for the iPad and phone. So whether you rely on Apple's accessibility features day to day or want to try out the latest dictation features, follow along for how to get started with and use voice control on your Mac. So with improvements to the Siri speech recognition, the on-device processing, they've given you a bunch of improvements for being able to control 
your computer with your voice. So this is how to get started and use voice control on your Mac. Now, again, you don't have to make notes on this, but it's slide 91 on the notes that are available on the web if you want to review this later. So you can tell Siri to turn on voice control, or you can open system preferences, scroll down, click on accessibility, scroll down to the left time, side to sidebar, click voice control, check the checkbox to enable voice control. It'll, your computer will download some files, so it'll take a few minutes. So that kind of looks like this. So when you go to accessibility, you'll scroll down to a voice control section. You'll have to enable voice control at the top right, and then it'll download for a few minutes. So you can use voice control, including dictating still. You can email clients. You can use it in messaging. You can any other where you would use text. You can also tell it to do custom commands. So what you'll see is on the screen for voice control, there's a commands button that I have highlighted there. And when you click that, you'll see all the different things that you can do with your voice. There's a whole list here. Quit Microsoft Word, hide Microsoft Word, quit iPhoto, hide iPhoto, a new item in a reminder or something, open document, save document, open Siri. So you can almost, there are people that have very limited vision that can use voice control to use their computers productively on a daily habit once you're used to the commands that you have to say. And you can also customize the commands. So at the bottom of the list, with their built-in commands, there's a plus sign that you can use. So there's a huge number of commands default. You can tell it all these things. Click on the number six, Click on double click on this number. So clicking on a command offers synonyms that can be used for the command. So you don't have to remember with this new theory and capability, you can say it in six different ways. Click the mouse, press the mouse, click, single click, single mouse click. If you say any of these, it's gonna do the action that you've told it to because it has better speech recognition that you don't have to say single click mouse every time. You can say click the mouse, single click. You can hold down a key and say the word click. So if you're interested in this, you can really dig into it using these settings. Another way is click the plus sign. You can then say, when I say, and type in what you wanna say, while using such and such, perform a certain action. So another neat trick is to get Hey Siri functionality on your Mac with voice control. So you can use the command open Siri or show Siri and then make your request instead of clicking the Siri icon in the dock or at the top of the screen. So you don't have to have any keyboard input to open Siri on your Mac with this. And you can also pause voice control. So some new Safari features in Catalina. So as we've discussed, a lot of things, uh, this is gonna cover every enhancement and Safari has a lot of new enhancements in Catalina that you've never seen before. So that's what these are gonna be. So first of all, the start page, when you go to your grid of your start pages, you're not only gonna see your favorites and frequently visited, but there's also maybe gonna be some series suggestions here based on even things you received in email and text messages. Someone sent you a link in an email or a text message that you haven't looked at yet, when you go to Safari, that may appear in this series suggestions. Somebody sent you a recipe and a message, but you forgot to look at it. Well, when you go here, it might be in that section at the bottom. There's no hard and true formula for what appears here, but it'll be based on things you've either looked at in the past or things that maybe someone has sent you. Tab switching. So when, you're in a, when you type in a website name, if that website's already open in another tab, so if you've got six tabs open, and one of them is the current NASCAR ratings, and you start typing in NASCAR, Safari will show you, hey, you've already got a tab open with, related to NASCAR. Do you want to switch to it now? And then you'll see a menu like this that shows you, and you can just click on the tab that's already open for NASCAR, rather than going back to the start page on NASCAR, or whatever site you're on. Another feature in Safari is the tile window to the left or right, like we saw with the finder windows and the application windows earlier by hitting the green dot and holding it. 
Safari has a feature under the window menu where you can tile a window to the left or right. So when you do that, what will happen is you'll see kind of a split screen like you may have seen on your iPad before. On your computer, you'll see two different windows open. So the left window is the window you started with. Little tiles on the right will be the other tabs you had open when you went to that split screen type of thing. So when you told it to tile that window to the left, instead of showing you all the little windows, it wouldn't show you 12 slices if you had 12 app opens. It shows you the primary window you started with, and then it shows you a little grid of the other tabs you have open. So you could easily zoom in on one of those by clicking on the grid. So if you click on one of the tiled window, it expands to fill the rest of the space next to the active main window. And you'll see in between the two, there's a little white dot. You can actually, if you click on that line between the two, you could toggle it left and right to give more real estate space, screen real estate to one of those windows or the other by sliding that divider over. Picture in picture is something new. So when you're watching a video, if you're on a YouTube page or a page with a video, if you click and hold the audio icon where you used to just be able to mute the window, you'll now be able to enter a picture in picture. So if you click enter in picture, enter a picture in picture, so you'll tap that, and then you'll see a little window pop up. So this little white window is the, the picture in picture window. And then you can hit the X button at the top of that. Or if you click and hold on the audio icon, you'll see more options. To, to close the window. So that's the little icon to close a picture in picture window. That's how you exit picture in picture. And again, we talked a little bit about the security before. Uh, Safari on both the Mac OS and the iOS has been pushing towards better password security for a while. But with Catalina's arrival, the desktop will actively warn you if you sign into a website with a weak password. So when this happens, it'll prompt you to change the password to something stronger. Safari, as always, will give you a suggested password which I usually hit choose my own and, and use one password to generate a password. But if you're using the Safari keychain and the, and the Safari password manager, you could let it create a password for you. And it'll be a good strong password. It'll offer to remember it and that will sync with all your devices. So if you open preferences, uh, Safari preferences, if you wanna see which passwords Safari has stored, if you go to preferences from the Safari menu, you can choose passwords. So if it's okay with you, we'll take like a 10 minute break now. You can stretch your legs, get a drink, and then we'll return here at 1122 in 10 minutes. And we will resume the day. Is this thing on? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's move on to screen time. Does anyone ever use screen time on their iOS device? Use it? Yeah, does anyone pay attention to that? I think the only people that might pay attention to that are parents with young children. Because I'm, I'm very, I, I, I pay attention to these changes a lot because they affect me because I'm a five-year-old and a nine-year-old and I want to monitor the screen time. But Apple has introduced screen time to the Mac You've had it available for your iOS devices a few years, for a few years now, but this is for the Catalina now. So I'm gonna review some of the features of that and maybe uh, you might be able to use it with your grandkids, but I doubt that most of you might be concerned. This can track app usage, notifications, the number of times you pick up your phone or device or, or laptop or log into your iMac. You can schedule downtime, app limits, apps that are always allowed and apps that are never allowed. So if you want to see how much time you've spent using each app, uh, you can see notifications from each app. So you can choose to see which notifications are received on your different devices through screen time. How many times you picked up your iPhone or computer, which apps you checked after first picking up. Downtime, so this is something I have with my kids, you can say, between the hours of 7 p.m. and 6 a.m., they can't use their device. And then they get a little five-minute warning and then to use the device after that time, the parent has to put in a passcode. 
So my wife puts in the passcode more than I do. <laughs> App limits, you can change. So this is my son, for example. I can say on the right there, I can say he can play games for one hour and he can play social networking entertainment, which is other fun things for an hour and a half every day. And then when he gets to that two and a half hour mark, he'll have to come to his mom or dad and say, can you give me some more time? And then we put in a code that he doesn't know yet and, then, and override the app limit for the day. So they, they give you a five minute warning and then you can also tell it to approve it for 15 more minutes or an hour or the rest of the day. They can also, if I'm not home and um, for some reason one of the kids gets to their time limit, they can send me a request and I'll get a notice on my phone even if I'm out and about, it'll say, Cameron wants more time, do you wanna allow it or no? So with kids, this is great. With adults, I don't know if it would come into play that often. You can also say which apps are always allowed, <laughs> content privacy, so you can go into and tell them that it's only okay to go to these websites. So he can't get to bikiniusa.com, but he can get to nationalgeographickids.com because I've said only these websites are accessible. So to turn on screen time, you go to system preferences. There's a new screen time app. There's a button at the top that says turn on, turn off. You can then specify which websites are available if you want. You can track usage. So this week, I was actually out of town in Kentucky. So I only was on the computer for like four hours, you know, in 42 minutes. And I was all in Keynote for four hours and 32 minutes, probably working on this presentation. So you can track your usage on these screens. And on all these pages, um, if you look at the PDF that was downloaded from the website, when you see a link on the bottom of the page, if you want to learn more about the system preferences or the screen time or the different features that I'm covering, on the pages that were applicable, there's a link to Apple's page covering that topic on the bottom of your, your, your PDF page. And those links are clickable if you download the PDF. So again, you can search screen time. Now this is something that's new with Catalina is that you can approve with Apple Watch. So if you have an Apple Watch and you've set up the setting and system preferences, which I'm gonna cover in a moment, you can use the Apple Watch to log into your computer and authenticate on times you might see a need to enter your computer password. You'll be able to authenticate that with your watch if it's on your wrists. So to automatically log in with the watch, if you're wearing your Apple Watch, you just wake up your Mac, the watch will authenticate. You won't have to put in your user password or even put your fingerprint on the Touch ID screen. If you turn the computer off, you'll have to re-enter your password once to reactivate the Apple Watch feature. So you can also use Apple Watch to approve other requests instead of entering your administrator password. So this feature requires that your watch be updated to OS 6 and that you have Catalina. So anytime you need to view your Mac password or use your Mac password, such as viewing passwords in Safari, unlocking a lock node, approving an app installation, unlocking settings and system preferences. So for example, when you click the lock to make a change now in system preferences, your Mac tells you shows you this screen that says it's trying to unlock, use password or put your fingerprint on there. If you have the watch on, on there, it'll automatically uh, show a screen on your watch. It'll say double click the side button twice and you'll be able to open or approve the purchase, the uh, transaction with that. So the way you enable this is if you go to security and privacy settings in that second section there from the top, use Apple Watch to unlock, uh, unlock apps and your Mac. You might only have one watch there, but you want to check the watches that you want to be able to unlock your Mac with and authenticate. That's how you turn this feature on. So that's another tip. I have an Apple Watch I call Apple Watch Sleep, and then I have my Apple Watch that I wear every day. But if you ever upgrade your Apple Watch, you can use your old watch to track your sleep if you want to if you're interested in, I don't know why I do it because I have two kids that are always waking me up. But I, 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 try, I try to track my sleep, but I never look at the data. But I wear one watch when I sleep just for that. And then I wear my other watch during the day. So if you're interested in sleep tracking and you get a new Apple watch, keep the old watch to at least track your sleep with instead of doing anything else with it. 
So that's where you can turn that on. So now let's move to what's new in Photos. So Apple has improved their Photos app. So photos you take can be correspond to an event, such as a birthday party, a vacation, a wedding, a trip to the beach. They're automatically then separated to a new memory type feature. If you've noticed the memories that have been showing up for a couple of years in photos where they kind of tie an event in together, that's a little more fine tuned now to actually capture events. So that they can be sorted both chronologically and geographically. Once sorted, Photos creates a cover photo by selecting an image, which it crops, zooms in on. These cover photos are getting pretty scarily accurate at featuring things that you'd want to feature on a cover photo. So the Catalina version has updated the Photos tab at the top to provide viewing options by years, months, days, and all photos. So selecting one of the tabs such as years, shows how the images are displayed. So you might find a birthday collection containing all the birthday images for each year. So if you want to go through these photos, it, which also contains live videos and photos, you can go through years, months, and days. I'm going to show you what this looks like in a moment. So live videos, which are the movies you take with your iPhone where it captures a few seconds before and after you, after you click the shutter button, will appear in the, the grid of photos, and they'll actually kind of play when you, when you open them up and see them. And in photos preferences, you can turn off whether they auto play like that. So when you pull up years and you're looking at a grid of photos, the ones that are videos will actually be playing within the screen so you can see the action. Memory movies are still there and you can edit those. So the photo sidebar, which you see here on the left, has been redesigned a little bit. So the most common items, and you may see more items if you have personal albums or uh, projects and stuff that are, that are completed. But so photos category is the one where you can organize it by chronologically year, month, day, or all photos. Memories is scanning your photos in the background to gather memories to rediscover past events you may have forgotten about. It'll create up to three memories a day, depending on the size of your image library. And it'll kind of sometimes pick up a random memory from a trip you took two years ago because it's just gotten around to doing that. Yes? Um, I was wondering, if, you're, if you put photos in a folder, say, you know, your brand book, mm -hmm. uh, the problem is I can't delete it out of my office to kind of keep that file down. It's like a duplicate. Right, when you have, uh, you have your main photo library and then you may have albums, your trip to Costa Rica, your granddaughter's graduation. If it's in an album, it has to be in kind of all photos. If you remove it from the album, it's still in all photos. If you delete it from all photos, it also disappears from the album. Especially if you're using iCloud Photos, you'll notice that you get a little warning. Hey, this photo is gonna be removed from all your devices. So it's not taking up any extra space. But there's a feature you can do in, on both iOS and macOS to hide a photo and it goes to a hidden album, but that would also hide it from the album. So there's no easy way to, to remove photos from all photos or hide them there without, they have to be in both places, but it's just kind of a copy of it. It's not really a whole duplicate. So you kind of have to get used to that. So again, people's gotten a little more accurate. It used to say faces, and now it says people. So the, the part that used to be called faces and it would just show people's faces and names, you can name that through people now. Places, now that most people are taking photos with their phones, by default, all the GPS data is on. So your photos will start to see and show, be able to show pretty accurate maps of where photos were taken although this won't count with photos that you scanned in from your grandmother's shoebox that you found years later. You know, those are all gonna be stamped with the date and location that you scan them. But photos you take usually have GPS data enabled, so you can get a pretty accurate map here. You'll also have a section called imports, recently deleted. So recently deleted items are things that you've put in the trash and the iCloud photos stay there for 30 or 40 days and then they just appear, disappear automatically. 
So don't throw anything in the trash in your photos that you might want to get back in six months because it'll probably be gone in 30 days after you move it to the trash. So the deleted items is not a good holding place for anything either on your desktop or your, or your photos. So the photo sidebar again is uh, some things you might see are albums. And when you go to the albums view, you might see albums that you're creating using iPhoto in the, in the 80s and 90s. You know, that's where all your albums are going to be from all the weddings, all the trips, all the recipes that you've tracked or whatever. And then projects, all the books, if you make calendars, if you make greeting cards, those stay in the project sections and those will carry over from your last iPhoto. Although since iPhoto uh, or photos has not now, you used to be able to buy your books and your calendars directly through Apple. They would have a third party printed. Now Apple is sending you directly to a third party vendor in photos. So if you're using something like Mimeo photos or a couple other options that are available, it'll prompt you to go to the app store and pick a photo manufacturer for your book or whatever. Now it will even be able to convert some of those old projects that, to a new vendor if you wish to do so. So I've, I've seen that happen. So you can also use the photos, the new photos to gain access to Aperture libraries. I told you earlier that Aperture had been disabled. So if you install Catalina, Aperture is dead, but, I, but the Photos app can still pull those photos from Aperture. So again, I told you earlier, you can uh, tell it by default, it will auto play live videos there. So at the bottom there, you see that checkbox. If you don't want those videos to auto play when you're scrolling through your photos, you can uncheck it using that button there. So this is what the new photos app looks like. So you'll see that there are all kinds of little squares, they're kind of a little tighter together than they used to be. And then you see that little slider at the top where the cursor is, that's how you can change the size of the thumbnails that are appearing. So you can zoom in or out using that. You can also click that little button to the left of the sidebar. It looks like a little arrow with two triangles at the top and bottom. What that will do is, if you click that, little button that's highlighted there with the red arrow. So these are all the photos. And you can toggle between whether the photos are like landscape orientation or whether they're just squares. And what it does is it doesn't just change it from a landscape to a square. It actually analyzes it and centers it so that your focal point of the picture is actually inside the square that it props it to. This is just the view only. You're changing it from spaces and, and uh, so you're changing it from this view to a tighter view. But when you go to that tighter view, it crops it pretty accurately to show you the content of the picture. So this is actually a series of pictures I did that I made a book for my son. Every day I took him to preschool, I took a picture while I was walking into school. And then at the end of the year, I had 150 of these and I put them into a book. <laughs> that he's too young for now, he's only five, but I'll give it to him in a few years. But uh, that was the walk to school photo. So that's where you hold that view. So that's what's new in photo. So now, let's look at sidecar. This is something we talked about a little earlier, where you can use your iPad as an extension of your desktop. So the ability to extend your Mac's display to a nearby iPad, either wired or wirelessly, it does not have to be connected to this. So a good amount of MacBook users already own an iPad. So this means essentially that a significant non number of people just received a secondary display for free. You can also use an iPad for a drawing tablet now if you have an Apple Pencil or even your finger. So some of the apps like Final Cut Pro, Adobe Illustrator, and iWork can use this where you can set your iPad next to your computer and use it to draw things like you would with a tablet prior. So the sidecar feature is supported by those models of the iPad, which is all the iPad Pro, 
iPad sixth generation or later, iPad mini third generation or later, or the iPad Air third generation. So the most recent iPad Air or any newer iPad can handle this sidecar feature. This is a list of the different apps that can support Apple's pencil input. If you have an Apple pencil with your device, So to extend or mirror your Mac desktop, this is how, these are the steps that you can do. They're on slide 145. So it'll tell you how to mirror your display. You go to the AirPlay menu, your iPad will be an option there. Uh, whereas before it might've just been your Apple TV under that AirPlay menu. So again, you can move your window to an iPad display. We talked about that full screen button earlier and how you could tie all your windows. And I showed you, if you have an, an iPad present, it may show you this move to the iPad Pro, which you can then tell it to slide over to the iPad that's next to your device, next to your laptop or iMac. And again, at the bottom of these pages, there's a link that will take you to Apple's page that describes this as well. Until one of them goes to sleep, but when you wake them back up, they'll still be in the same place. So until you, if you take your iPad out of the room, I think it only works within Bluetooth and Wi-Fi range. So I think if you took your iPad like into another room or, or left with it, it would just shut off. But yeah, I don't think you have to manually disconnect if you're taking your iPad somewhere, but you, otherwise you could manually disconnect. So you can use the sidebar you have different controls you can use with Sidecar in the sidebar of the iPad. And you'll see these symbols and that tells you what you can do with those. And a lot of those are the same shortcuts you might use on your Mac. So that's what it'll look like. You see on the left, you have like a command key. So you can hold that command key to do a command P to print, for example, from your iPad. So if you've got a keyboard with it, you can use that command button to do things the option button and the control buttons are there. So if you're drawing or using some tools that might toggle to another feature with the, when you hold down one of those keys, that's why those are on the screen of the iPad. Sidecar preferences are a new system preference. So when you go to system preferences, you'll see an option for Sidecar where you'll see the different choices you have with Sidecar. So QuickTime is Apple's built-in video player. That got a lot of new features. I'm gonna kind of go through these quickly because it's, it's about 20 slides, but I'm gonna kind of give you an overview of some of the new things you can do with QuickTime. You may or may not use, but you can definitely go back to slides 150 to 170 or something to, to dig in a little more. So you can choose a screen size, and this is for your Mac on QuickTime Player. So you can go to full screen, you can use the green arrow to do a left tile or a right tile. There's an actual size to fit the way that people made the movie, which might be a more horizontal 16 by nine, like movie screen ratio, fit to screen or full screen only. They have a panoramic view now with, for these big panoramic shots, it'll squeeze the photo in and there'll just be a black bar at the top and bottom. You can choose soundtracks for movies in QuickTime Player on Mac. So again, this is not a iMovie type production program as much as it is just a, a default way to look at videos that you might see or download on your Mac from some source that's not a, a DVD or something. So QuickTime will, will show a lot of movies that uh, you might have gained, not through Apple TV or something, that, that That'll be shown through TV, but home movies or movies projects that you've made will appear in QuickTime. There's a way to show titles or sub captions in QuickTime Player now. You can edit a movie as far as trim and rearrange clips, but it's not really iMovie control, but it's pretty good control for a little, little program like this. So this shows you how to set the playhead and split clips, how to rearrange clips how to add an entire movie to another movie, adding a new clip, how to rotate a clip. You can either flip it horizontally or vertically or left and right. You can trim a clip, remove audio from a clip in a movie. You can use automator tips. 
Now, another new thing you can do on your Mac, and some of this will be in the tips and tricks that I do next week, but you can use QuickTime to record your Mac screen. So if you're in QuickTime and you go to the file menu, you go to new screen recording, you'll then have some controls for the volume. You can choose options to get choices for the built-in camera, or if you have an external camera like this, or a microphone to connect it to your computer, you can choose which microphone you're using. There are different settings you can do for 4K video and, and better sound and such. You can also connect a device to your Mac with a wire, open the QuickTime Player app, choose File, New Recording, and then record video record the screen of your iPad or iPhone if it's connected. So if you want to do a screen recording for some reason of your iPad or iPhone with your computer, now they, you also have the screen recording option on your device now in the control center of your iPhone. But if you wanted to use your Mac to record from your iPhone, you could go in, connect the device, and under the camera setup, you would choose your connected iPhone, iPad, or iPad Touch, choose the microphone and the quality, and then you can then record the screen and save it. You can also record audio in a QuickTime player. These are the settings you would do. And then you would capture your, this is how you can capture your iPhone or iPad. So you would connect device, choose new movie recording, choose your iPad as the camera. Now home, Apple's also done some new things with the home app. So home sit secure, home kit secure video. So when you have different cameras, you might have a ring camera or a nest camera or an owl camera set up for your front door or your, your backyard or something. Apple has now worked with certain camera manufacturers so that those videos are actually encrypted. And if anyone else got access to them, they couldn't be accessed. So they're encrypted for the device. So that's a new thing. In a home kit, uh, in AirPlay 2, which are new software updates and hardware updates for your home pods and such, can now play Apple Music and Scenes if you automate it with other home kit accessories. So when you walk in or at 6 p.m., you might have some lights come on. Now you can also start some music at that time. That's been built into home kit. Before it was just turn the light on or off or turn the light to blue. So if you use the home kit devices, you can do that a little bit. Now, something that's coming soon, whoops, is iCloud photo sharing. So this is what's on Apple's website. This is the most recent information. You can now share folders with a private link. Anyone who has access can see this folder in iCloud Drive, add new files, and get the latest version of files. So we were talking a little bit about Dropbox earlier, how it's great for sending 100 photos for a wedding. With iCloud, this would be great. But then if you see that little asterisk there, it says coming this spring. So that feature, even though they touted it with the, all the previews of Catalina, hey, you're gonna be able to use iCloud to file share and, and send folders to people, you still can't do that yet. You can share individual files from iCloud, but you can't successfully share entire folder and give editing permissions and viewing permissions yet. But sometime this spring, which, is now, I guess, or I don't even know, is it still technically winter, or I don't know what Apple's version of spring is, but probably in the next month or two, you may be able to do that. There's also a new app on your phone, or on your Mac, called Find My. So you've also always been kind of used to using the Find My Phone on your device, your handheld device, to find your iPad that's in the other room, or find your phone that you left in a purse. So that has been, you used to have to go to the iCloud website and go to find my iPhone and then look at a map on a web interface. Now it's an app, much like you have on your iPhone that used to be called Find My iPhone. Now on all the devices, it's just called Find My. That's combined Find My Friends, which was a place to locate, uh, an app that would locate friends and family and find your devices. So now it's called Find My. So all your devices are displayed on a map. You can zoom in or out to get a better picture. Tapping on a device provides you with options to get directions to its location in Apple Maps. You can play a sound for locating a lost device or get a no notification when it's found if offline. 
You can also locate friends. So if you have a friend or family member that's actually shared their location with you, they will show up in this list. So you'll notice you have two tabs at the top, people and devices. So the people will show the different people and it will show you where they are on a map if that, that person has shared their location with you and only them. So since the entire system is encrypted, other people can't get to your devices, nor can Apple. So the devices are only trackable by you. So a new first, another new version is, it lets you find a Mac after you've had it lost or stolen by tracking down its location on a map. Even if the missing computer isn't connected to the web, Apple anonymously and invisibly enlists people with iPhones, MacBooks, and other Apple gear to try to detect it using some Bluetooth, low Bluetooth energy signal. So if another, if you leave your iPhone or laptop in Belize in a hotel room, and it is even offline, but it's still powered on, and the maid is walking by the hall and she's got an iPhone, Apple will use her iPhone to tell you the location of the phone, and it's all anonymous and secret and done in the background. So it, it can't be intercepted by anyone else, but that's pretty neat. That it could help you find your phone, but somehow it does it anonymously. So I, that's pretty cool. So again, you'll have access to all your devices. You can locate friends, privacy. Now a few new features in mail. Typically in mail on your phone, you might have seen a button at the bottom of the email that said unsubscribe. Now you'll have the option right at the top of the mail message like this to unsubscribe if it's a mailing list. So that's new. And then it'll say unsubscribe. Mail will send, Apple will send an email on your behalf to that vendor telling them to unsubscribe. So when you, you'll have to confirm it and then they'll do that. Now another thing you can do, if, now if you do do this, if you wanted to get new emails from LL Bean, you'd have to go to their website and sign up again. So there's no resubscribe button from here. You'd have to go back to the individual website. Now, another thing you can do now that you used to be able to do with phone calls, but you can now do in Mac mail, you can block contacts. So if your pesky brother-in-law or your long lost uncle keeps sending you these bad jokes or political things, if you click on their name where you'll have the option to copy their address or add contact, you can now block contact. What that means is when that person sends you an email, it goes directly to the trash. So you'd have to look in your trash to see where, who you have blocked sent messages. But that's a nice new feature. So if you click on the name and say block contact. So and then one of the last things I wanna cover is we talked a little earlier about iPads and iPhones. And you used to be able to connect them to iTunes and back them up to your computer. It's still kind of the same thing, but now they appear like external drives in the finder window. So if you look at the left column here, that's my iPhone and it shows up with the other external drives. And then you see the software, you see these different tabs at the top for the battery. Do you want to do music? You can find all your serial number and stuff there, by the way, but this is where you can specify now which music you want to sync, which movies, which TV shows, which podcasts, which audiobooks, and which books. You used to do all this through iTunes. Now it just shows up as an external disk in the Finder, and you can specify what you're syncing there. And you can also your serial number and your IMEI there. The last thing I want to cover is Time Machine with the Mac. So basically, Time Machine hasn't changed in the process. If you plug in a disk, your computer's gonna ask you, do you wanna use this for Time Machine? And, or for Time Machine, you say yes or no. So the most extended format for Time Machine is Mac OS extended format journal, but it also supports case sensitive journal and XSAN. So important, you can back up from an HFS or APFS, which is Apple's formatting system disk, to an HFS disk. However, Time Machine can't back up to an APS formatted disk. So if you 
your file system on your computer, your hard drive, is probably at this point with Catalina, an APFS file system. And, but Time Machine can't use an APFS file system. You can't reformat your external drive as APFS. It won't back up to it. And it will do this automatically. You cannot possibly use it if you don't do this. So you don't really have to worry about the type of file formatting on your external hard drive because Time Machine can only back up to an HFS plus format now. And if you, even if you set it as APFS and you tell it to back up, it's gonna change it back to HFS, HFS plus. So that doesn't have to be worried about really. And again, the, the master boot record, these are SMB as a Windows type formatting. So that really doesn't come into play. Now the two major third party backup programs are now compatible. They've released betas or full version updates for Carbon Copy Clone, Cloner and Super Duper so that you can use these programs as Catalina now. When Catalina first came out, these weren't released yet. But as of this past week, they both have working versions of their software that are compatible with Catalina. So even if you run your Go64, you look at your system report to check for 32-bit apps. If SuperDuper and Carbon Copy Cloner are listed in your current 32-bit apps, they do have 64-bit versions available now. So those are safe and a lot of people were holding off. Some of the security things, we talked about permissions. Your data is a lot more safe with Catalina. The gatekeeper's been improved to check for malicious software. Secure activation lock. Uh, if somebody stole your laptop, it would only be good for parks. Secure home video we talked about. And that's it. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm using a uh, time machine right now. Yeah, after you update, you'll get the option to, uh, it, it'll just be seamless. If you were replacing your machine, you have to inherit the backup history from your prior time machine. But when you update to Catalina, the time machine will carry on seamlessly. Yes, sir. I heard there's some issues with like print drivers and stuff, with old printers. They have if you have an old, a really older printer, um, you'll use that 32-bit check okay. to check the software. Because there are some printers, like a, a six-year-old Epson laser, might not work with Catalina, and Epson's not going to fix it because they're selling new printers already, and they make their money on the ink. They don't care about the hardware. Uh -huh. So yeah, check your check your 32-bit apps either with Go64, and make sure your printer isn't listed because your printer very well could be disabled after Catalina if you if you don't pay attention to that. Good Great. point. What Marie? No, nothing. If you just choose not to upgrade to Catalina either because you don't want to or your software won't handle it, you're, you're not going to lose any of the existing features, but you won't be able to do anything that we showed today. <laughs> so if any of this stuff looks good to you, you need Catalina to do that. So if you're here, you're not going to install Catalina, this might not be that helpful. And I want to say next week, uh, a week from today, I'll be doing 50 Mac OS tips and tricks for your Mac desktop and laptop. So if you want to gain shortcuts and ways to make better use of your time on your device, on your Macintosh or iMac specifically, your desktop, that'll be a good class because you'll, you'll be guaranteed to learn a few things that you didn't know. Yes? If I can't call me after today, if I paid $15, then you would email me the, the notes? These notes, if you go to our website and go to class notes and go to 2020, these notes are free to download even if you didn't pay the 15 bucks, I think. So yeah, if you, if you can't attend for some reason, you can get the slides to see the entire content. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you all for coming. See you next week.